Hey guys, welcome to the BWR Kansas race recap. I'm super excited for this one. I'm not sure how to describe it other than it was probably the most dynamic race I've ever been a part of. Here just on my computer, I'm just going to read you a sentence by the BWR organizer at the end of the race. This was by far the most exciting BWR in 12 years of unroadiness. There were so many different breaks that got away where we thought that was the winning move only to have the group reform before another attack would get up the front. So I mean this gives you a little idea of how crazy it was out there. The good news is that the Belgian Waffle Ride takes race footage very seriously. So they have a kind of a company that's part of Belgian Waffle Ride that's called Unroad Unlimited. And the main content producer there is uh, called Jake. And Jake is a master droner, as we call him. So he's super good with the drone. And uh, during the race, he just fly his drone in between our head. The first time you do a BWR, you're kind of scared of the drone and you're like, get away, get away, get away. But you soon realize that Jake is just super, super good at handling his drone and that there's really no danger. He has like those big like goggles that you see like you're flying. So um, footage is great. The race, how it played out was amazingly dynamic, as I said before. So um, hopefully you appreciate the recap. Let's do it. So everything started in downtown Lawrence at 7.30, so not too early of a start. I really like those slightly later start, gives me a better night of sleep the day before. So we started, we had a 5k neutral, everyone was already kind of fighting for position even in the neutral because we knew that at 13k we had the first very technical sector of the day and it's the entrance of the snake farm. So the way the course is built, why it's so dynamic, why it's so fun as a racer is that there are actually four sectors that are really, really hard technically. So you have the first one that's that 13 kilometers in. After that, you have another one that's approximately in the middle of the course. And after that, you have the two last ones that are in the last 40k. So the last 40k of this race, 20k of the last 40k are actually single track, I would call them. They're not all single track, but they're far from a gravel road. So yeah, we entered the first sector. I was actually super well placed, second wheel. It was actually kind of a hard fight for this sector. I made it kind of easier for myself by attacking just on a climb that was just like 1k and a half before the entrance of the sector. So I was able to stretch out the group and then keep a good position. What would normally be a really fun, dirty diversion of unroadiness was turned into a very stressful three kilometers of racing. This opener, the Kleinschlang, sits on over 100 acres of pristine Lawrence, Kansas terrain called the Snake Farm, which is owned by Matt Gilhausen. On the property, Matt has created a cyclocross course that gets used for local races. Those who studied the course knew this would be a pinch point. If a rider got caught behind another who lacked the unroad skills of a true cross racer, then gaps would open up. And that's exactly what happened. So in that sector, I mean, I just drilled it. The guy that was in front of me actually crashed. So I was by myself at the front, just hitting it. I had pre-ride that sector the day before. So I kind of knew where I could push it. So um, it's approximately 3K. And at the end of the sector, we were just a group of six. So for me, that was mission accomplished. I was not thinking this group of six would necessarily stick. I was helping it a lot because my goal was just to make the guys behind work as hard as possible to come back. Finally, they actually did come back. And we were a group of like 10 to 15 and I actually thought, oh, that might be the group for the day. That, that might be one of those races where it's just a small group all day. 
but finally it all regroup and we were to my surprise and I think to everyone's surprise back to a group of about 50 to 60 riders. So from then on we didn't slow down we had approximately 70k until the last very technical sector and this sector that was coming up is actually the hardest of the race it's a 10k sector called Perry Lake Trail and it's crazy bad especially for tires so in the 70k before that sector people were still attacking people were trying to keep gap at one point i had to do a 10 minute bridge that uh, took a lot out of me i did it by myself because six guys that were pretty much all the strongest guys were in front so you had nicholas roach stetna griffin i think you had Kerry warner in that group also and uh, I was just like, I need to bridge up. I don't know if that group is gonna stick and, and win the race. So I did bridge up by myself, but finally, again, everyone came back. Uh, Brendan Wartz was a big part of the guys coming back. So uh, at the entrance of Perry Lake Trail, we were a group approximately of 30, 40, I would call it, because with all those attack, some guys had lost our group. So um, yeah, we entered that sector. I was actually second at the entrance. I did the... Uh, pretty good handlebar fight with Griffin but at the end he got the best of me if you want to see that handlebar fight uh, Kerry Warner actually has it on film so you can go check uh, his uh, BWR recap you see it very well and it was actually a fun fight at the entrance of the sector we both laughed because we kind of realized maybe we didn't have to push to push that fight that much for one sector but um, I mean it, it was super fun and it was not uh, dangerous per se so both of us were just fighting in dull bars like you do at the road race 200 meters. The Perryberg Forest is truly the most unique feature of the Kansas-Belgian waffle ride. At eight kilometers in length, it tests riders' abilities to bunny hop, transcend rocks, dismount, remount, and otherwise navigate a forest that's fraught with perils of all kinds, including poison oak. The sector is essentially a walking trail that the local Sunflower Bike Shop and Belgian waffle ride crews come together to clear out. It takes several days for the full sector to be cleared enough to ride, but of course, the boulders and fallen trees can't be removed, so they are left along the trail for riders to navigate. So in the sector, it didn't take too long for Kerry to pass me. At first, I was trying to follow Kerry and uh, Griffin, but it was very, very technical sector, and I just smashed my rim one or two times, my black ink rim, and I was okay, the Purell tires hold up very good, but I was like, it's just not worth it. If I come out of the single track with those guys, I don't think we're gonna make it to the line at just three guys with such great guys behind us. So I just kind of chilled, let myself catch by five guys, and at the end of the sector, we were a group of six. Brendan Wartz came up on us, and we actually cut Kerry not too long after. So then we were a group of eight guys and Griffin was at the front and we kind of knew we would catch Griffin sooner than later. But again, to our surprise, we worked like super well together, but a group of about seven other guys came up on me with uh, Pete and Nicholas Roach. I think those two guys were a very big part of bringing back that move. So yeah, they came back on us. We were a group of 15. That kind of messed up the chemistry in the group. But uh, having Griffin in front was enough to kind of keep it working a little bit, but more in a way that we were just attacking each other. So there was no like rotation. It was just like every time there would be a kicker, we would attack each other. Until riders actually come to Lawrence, Kansas, they don't have a true appreciation for the hilliness of the region. It's comprised of beautiful country gravel roads that undulate endlessly and twist and turn through the farmlands. So with all those attacks uh, at one point, a group of very strong guys was able to kind of create a separation. So at the front, you had Stetna, Roach with uh, two other guys and they cut Griffin. And I was at the back with Corey Wallace, Kerry Warner, Brendan Wartz, who else? Alex Owen. And the guys in front were kind of taking ground, but super, super slowy. Is that a word? I, I guess you understand. So they were taking some ground and we were like kind of team trialing just at like maybe 10 to 20 seconds from each other. But at one point you could feel that we were slowly losing some ground. And uh, 
I just knew it was a matter of time. And I was like playing a strategy. I was like, I'm not sure I want to be the one committing to that move. And I especially don't want to go bridge by myself. So I was like looking at guys and thinking like, would someone follow me if I attack? But when I was thinking about that, Brendan had enough. So Brendan actually attacked us in a false flat and I was the only one able to follow. And uh, yeah, we just look at each other. We said to ourselves, let's took 30 second pulls, let's go even so nobody complains. And uh, that's what we did. And we did a super hard chase. I mean, every pulls was over uh, 400 easy. And uh, after like five minutes of chasing, we make it back to the front group. So at that point, we had a front group of seven riders and uh, we still had the two uh, technical sector left. So we kind of just rotated in the, not an easy pace, but like just a tempo pace to make sure the guys at the back wouldn't come back. Because you got to remember that at the back you had, for example, Curry Wallace and Kerry Warner. So those guys are maybe a little bit less good physically, but they're super good technically. So the goal is not to bring them with you at the entrance of those super technical sector. So we were making sure to work together to make sure the second group wouldn't come back. One of the things that sets the Belgian waffle ride apart is the way the front of the race is managed. While there are often police escorts, no matter what, there are always two motos leapfrogging between intersections, covering for traffic control and leading the riders into and out of unroad sectors that other vehicles can't go. Another thing is that there are lead vehicles that handle both media coverage, often with journalists along for the show, as well as rider support in terms of food and hydration. Not only is it incredible to see the action unfold for anyone privy to such front row seats, it is also an added amenity that riders enjoy in terms of all kinds of support. So we finally hit the, the snake farm. The Schlangenwinkel Dulhof, or the snake farm as it's affectionately known. It's an incredible cyclocross course with all sorts of whoops and jumps and twisting turns plus a bunch of grass chicanes, rocky ascents in myriad places to falter, fall behind, or as many found out, fall. It's so much fun to ride, but on race day after so many miles and so many attacks, this is definitely a place where things can open up or get closed down. The dynamics of this sector cannot be overstated. There is every kind of challenge created here to test riders in new and untold ways. It's heaven for some and a new level of hell for others. We entered that sector and Griffin just smashed it. Um, he was clearly the, the best technically out of all of us. And uh, Pete and I were the only one able uh, to follow. And I was, I would say, the one that was struggling the most out of us three. And uh, sometimes I would get gapped by like 10 meters and come back, get gapped by 10 meters. And uh, I was finally able to exit that last part with those guys. And we didn't take any rest because we knew other guys were also chasing. So we rotated very good, but it's a very good uh, false flat going down. So that's very good for me because I'm heavier than those guys. So um, I felt like I was able to recover way more than them because they're lighter guys. So when it goes up, if I take really when we go up with those guys, I'm the one killing myself. But if it's a false flat, I'm kind of the one that can recover the most because I'm like 20 pounds or more heavier than those guys. So um, yeah, recover well, legs came back super well. And the last single track was 5K from us. And that last single track, I know it by heart because last year I did Big Sugar and I drove straight to BWR Kansas. That was the week after. So it was the contrary this year. This year, BWR Kansas was before Big Sugar. And all that week, I pretty much only rode that single track. So my goal was to really enter that single track first because I knew those guys were expecting me to be weaker in the technical section because I just showed them that I was weaker than them in, in some technical aspect of it. Because in the snake farm, as you can remember, I was for sure the, the guy that was most struggling in all of us three. So the way it's set up, is that you have kind of super long straight line and then you turn right and it's like a bike path. So you have to go, go around something that kind of blocks the car from entering. So it's kind of sketchy. So my thing was really to attack super close to that thing. So I could get a gap, 
get inside that and it was tailwind actually. So I was like, with that tailwind, I can drill it. And after that, you enter on the left, the single track. That's exactly what I did. So uh, the car came up to us super close to the part where the car cannot go in anymore. And uh, apparently they asked us for bottles. So uh, Pete took a bottle. And as soon as Pete uh, was done taking a bottle, that's where I put my dig in. And uh, yeah, I was just like able to create a super big gap from the jump. I attacked with every, everything I had and I had like a 20 second gap into that last single track. And uh, from that on, I just uh, went all in and in that single track was uh, able to increase my lead. And at the end of the single track, I didn't know how far those guys were. I was pretty confident that I would have it because I knew I had pretty much rolled the single track perfectly. But uh, I just made sure to uh, get in my TT position and uh, hammer it until the finish. And I was finally able to uh, finish with the two minutes 30 gap or something. There were never ending attacks happening throughout the race. So it never settled into anything resembling a controlled pace. Each new attack would spell doom for any of the riders clinging to the rear. There were enough hills to allow the stronger riders to continually apply pressure to the group. This race had more attacks and a variety of different riders off the front than any other Belgian waffle ride in history. So, um, yeah, that's it for the BWR Kansas race recap. I hope you appreciate it. Again, thank you very much to Unroad for the footage. They have actually a YouTube channel if you want to follow them. So if you don't want to miss any of the drone shot of the Belgian waffle ride, the link of their channel would, will be in the description. Super excited. Next year, there are more Belgian waffle ride. I don't know how it can be possible. This year we had five. Apparently next year, there's going to be more than five. There is actually four that are already confirmed. And I'm sure Kansas is going to be back. I hope it's going to be back because it's for sure up there in terms of enjoyability for a rider. I hope you like the recap. Thank you for listening. And as usual, take care of yourself by making the most optimal choice in every moment and to the same to take care of the ones you love.